All right. So first of all, I want to um, impress upon you the importance of this discussion uh, for you personally, because um, likely each of you will um, be impacted by this uh, disease, if not you personally, then somebody you care for, because it's incredibly common. 3% of the American population at some point, or currently, is symptomatic with uh, symptoms from herniated disc. It's more common in men at about two to one ratio. Peaks in the age of 30 to 50, though we see it in anyone from, you know, children all the way up through the elderly. And it's incredibly common in athletes. And this is particularly problematic because obviously many, this is how they're, they're uh, making their livelihood through athletics and this can negatively impact their careers. So first I want to just talk a little bit about a normal healthy disc, um, purpose of the disc. Uh, the disc is uh, served predominantly as a shock absorber. So the outer part of the disc, the annulus, uh, is concentric rings that encapsulate uh, the nucleus. And the nucleus is a homogeneous uh, consistency that has a high water um, affinity. So it's a high water content. And what that does is when there's a force applied to the spine, that force then is dispersed evenly throughout the disc space. That protects the vertebral body so that there's not one vertebral body uh, rubbing against the implant of the other. And that is uh, particularly important because much of the nutrient vessels uh, that supply the disc, which is fairly vascular, live in that location. So it's important that that disc be there. So this is a schematic, kind of a poor schematic, a caveat concept of a, of a disc. So the dough would be, of course, the annulus with the uh, nucleus being the jelly. The annulus, though, rather than doughy, is more like, like a Kevlar. So it's very, very strong. So a pathologic disc, what happens for a disc to become herniated is initially there has to be, generally, there's some pathology. So typically a herniation doesn't occur in a perfectly healthy normal disc. There's usually some degeneration that's already occurred. Um, and that process occurs with birthdays and uh, any type of wear and tear activities. So we'll see decreased height of the disc, loss of water content. When the nucleus loses water content, uh, it starts to form hard clumps within within the, and so it's not a homogeneous consistency. So now when a, a, a force is applied to the spine, rather than being distributed evenly throughout the disc, there are uh, focal areas of high pressure zones where these clumps are located. And then what can happen is that these clumps can compress up against and pop perhaps through the annulus, resulting in a herniation. So this is another um, schematic, am I wrong with this? Oh, there we go schematic of the, um, with the unhealthy looking disc or unhealthy donut. So on a recent trip, uh, medical trip to Nepal, I noticed that this is how the Nepalese people carry everything. So if you notice this guy um, on your uh, right is carrying these rocks, so I can't imagine how heavy that is, but this is from women, children, elderly, everybody, they carry everything through these baskets. And notice that the, um, the only support for this is this rope that goes around the base of the basket and then attaches to the patient's head. So these are the kind of activities that result in degenerated disc and herniations. So this is a sagittal view. You can see that the um, upper areas show nice healthy disc with lots of water content. At the L5-S1 level, we see the, um, the disc herniation. Oh, I could use this disc herniation there. Um, so um, again, this is not, um, at this level where the herniation is, you can see that this is not a healthy disc as compared to these other areas where there's a lot of water content. To understand whether or not this is problematic or symptomatic for the patient, of course you need other views. Um, this is not the same, same uh, image, but this axial image shows where there is a, um, protrusion here that's impacting the exiting nerve group through here. So this is likely symptomatic. However, that being said, not all herniated discs are symptomatic. Many people will have, uh, in fact, I'll oftentimes uh, in a room to examine a patient 
and um, think I have it all figured out. I've seen their MRI, I know what their symptoms are going to be, and they don't have symptoms that correlate with that at all. They may have the opposite side or a different level, so you have to look to see whether or not it's, it has any import for the patient. So, does every patient um, benefit from a non operative approach? I would be biased to say, and of course, most do. There's a couple, a couple situations where I think patients deserve an immediate um, um, trip to see a surgeon. And of course, if there's, if there's a motor deficit, especially if it's progressive, that patient should be evaluated surgically and determine whether or not um, surgical intervention is necessary to retain function. Cauda equina syndrome it is a surgical emergency. And then intractable pain, though, is not a um, um, necessarily an indication for surgery, but if you're not able to control a patient's pain by other means, then that would certainly be a final option. So the reason, one of the biggest arguments, I think, to um, delay surgery and look at non-operative care is because the natural history. Most patients with a herniated disc tend to resolve their symptoms if given enough time. So the key is given enough time. So if people are really suffering, they may not be able to wait the whatever length of time it would take for this to heal. So there are a lot of different modalities that can be utilized. And the number of patients that have these herniated discs, we don't even exactly know the numbers because most patients will engage in whatever therapy they're familiar with or comfortable with. So in our community, you know, we have all kinds of things that people see. And in fact, this one's become more popular. And in fact, I think they have a strain specifically for herniated discs. So at least I, I seem like it. So there was a study that the spine outcome, uh, spine patient outcome research trial was um, specifically designed to look at the question of whether patients um, are better off having surgery or having a non-operative approach. So patients were divided, randomized into two groups. Um, all patients had to have a minimum of six weeks of a combination of lower back pain and leg pain, and specifically the radicular pain had to go below the knee. So mind you, with uh, a herniated disc, patients can be asymptomatic, they can have only back pain, they can have back and leg pain, or just leg pain, or some portion of leg pain, but specifically these patients had all of it. And then, uh, they, and they also had to have their pain for a minimum of six weeks. They then follow these patients, and uh, at six weeks, three months, six months, one year, and even up to two years, and what they found is that there really is not a st statistical difference between a surgical group and non-surgical group. So, so there was a couple of issues with this study. One is that um, though patients were randomized to either surgery or conservative uh, treatment, there was a lot of crossover. So some patients that were initially put in a surgery group went into uh, decline surgery and then vice versa. So it might have skewed the data a little bit. The other thing which I think is the greater flaw is that the non-operative care was not standardized. So some patients actually were followed up at those appropriate intervals but they received no treatment whatsoever. Others received anti-inflammatories, some received physical therapy, 42% received epidurals, so a lot of variability within that group. So in some ways, it's, it's kind of leading, uh, leading us a little bit blind into what that would actually have done. So the question was, with the, this initial study looked at all comers. Everybody who presented with back and leg pain, whether you were a construction worker, an athlete, any walk of life. A subsequent study was looking at specifically athletes to determine whether or not that specific group had an advantage going to uh, surgery earlier so they could return to their sport sooner. And actually what was found is that, uh, again, not a statistical difference. Slight improvement with surgery, but not statistically significant. And what's really interesting is that in the hurry to get back to their sport, less than 60% were able to return at their pre-injury level. And that is really significant just to, so that we understand just how impactful a herniated disc can be for certain populations. I mean, if a person's livelihood is based on this, that they may, they may have lost their career. So I want you to keep in mind as we talk about this, I, I would argue that the importance of addressing a herniated disc is, is that not necessarily to be thinking about treating this instance, but to realize that this is more of a systemic illness and that if we can do certain things 
early on to prevent the development of herniated discs, then this can avert lots of, lots of issues. Similar study looking at um, return to play for elite athletes found uh, the same types of uh, non-statistical difference. Uh, most patients were able to return to play, but again, not at the former levels. So going back to the idea that herniated disc is a um, systemic illness and there are lots of confounding factors. Um, oh, sorry, I skipped the one here. Uh, this final one looks at whether or not the benefit of um, surgery versus non-operative, if those results are sustained, not just at two years, but up to eight years. And in fact, at eight years, looking at primary outcomes, um, there's no statistical difference. However, secondary outcomes, um, which included um, patient satisfaction, bothersomeness of uh, sciatica, there was a slightly greater improvement in the surgical group. So looking at factors that um, impact um, success with treatment uh, of the herniated disc, and again, whether that, so whether that treatment is surgery or non-operative, there are a number of factors that will negatively impact that patient's uh, response. So smoking, for example, has a negative, uh, is a negative predictor for success. So smoking uh, decreases the vascularity of the disc, which is already avascular. So smokers will tend to have a higher incidence of degenerative changes, which then um, promote um, uh, or predispose to herniation. Uh, depression um, is, is a poor predictive factor. Comorbid uh, joint disease um, associated both with um, obesity, but also other types of um, uh, arthritic conditions, osteoporosis, that, that sort of thing. These are patients that tend to uh, do poorly with treatment. Um, disability, and this isn't disability as a neurologic deficit, but disability in terms of work status. Uh, severity of, of axial pain, so if a patient has predominance of lower back pain, those patients tend to do uh, worse with either, either modality of treatment. Um, and then symptoms that have been protracted for over six months. So keeping in mind, again, that this is a systemic condition, and if all these, if these comorbid conditions can be addressed, ultimately one can have a better outcome. So I'm just going to gloss over a little bit of the, the non-surgical treatments, um, the most of them, because I've even they've been addressed previously, but um, clearly a standard, at least in this community, is physical therapy, um, anti-inflammatories are fairly routine. Other modalities can be added depending on the patient's presentation, the chronicity of their symptoms, the severity of their symptoms. Um, if there are sleep disturbances, that may be addressed. Um, per patient preferences may lead them to you know, any number of other types of care. And all of these have um, shown to have some validity. Uh, epidural steroids or oral steroids um, can be very helpful in patients with um, more severe symptoms or um, um, symptoms that are a little more resistant to other, other forms of treatment. So and again, I'm going to just run through these briefly since they've already been addressed, but um, anti-inflammatories are useful for dealing with the inflammatory components of so the nerve root is particularly inflamed. These can be useful. Um, um, the anti-seizure drugs, gabapentin and pregabalin have already been addressed by Dr. Dens. Again, those can have uh, utility for treating the neuropathic component of pain. Muscle relaxants may be useful if there's a spasmodic component. Uh, the antidepressants, and specifically velocity, may have a, an important role for diminishing symptoms. And I'll leave these, these are in there uh, in the slide uh, for your reference, but they, again, they've all already been addressed. Um, acetaminophen does um, uh, warrants being addressed only in that just recently the dose in the uh, opioid um, preparations has been reduced because of the um, significant uh, issue with hepatotoxicity. So the overall maximum dose should not, should, sorry, should not be more than 4,000 milligrams a day. Tramadol is a unique medication that acts both um, by elevating serotonin and also by um, uh, acting weakly the new receptor. It may be useful for people who have uh, mild or moderate symptoms. We've been through the, the medications, I'll skip through these. Um, so finally, I'd like to talk a, a bit about epidural steroid injections and what their role can be um, in treating um, 
symptoms of a herniated disc, and specifically um, symptoms that include radiculopathy. So there are two approaches to the epidural space that are useful. Um, one is the, um, the transpyramidal approach, which is um, in the cervical spine is coming in anteriorly, and the lumbar spine is paramedian. Uh, that allows deposition of steroid and usually local anesthetic uh, directly on the nerve root um, that's inflamed. Uh, and that can be particularly useful for people who have a single nerve root uh, irritation and or for diagnostic purposes, if there's a need to determine whether or not that nerve root is, is the one that's causing the pain. Um, an interlaminar epidural is a more traditional approach. The um, interlaminar approach is uh, from the posterior aspect of the patient. It allows deposition of uh, steroid and local anesthetic either centrally or to um, one side or the other. What it doesn't allow um, you to control is the flow in a cephalocaudal direction, but you can specifically uh, target it to one side or the other. And this can be actually very useful for patients who have um, multi-level disease, bilateral symptoms, um, and is, is commonly used in kind of the elderly population that has uh, disease throughout the spine. So this is an image of a interlaminar cervical epidural. And in this patient, uh, so the patient's prone, so this patient's left is your left. And you can see that the needle um, is here. And it's just, just off midline to the left. So this here is the dye, which demonstrates the distribution where the medication will be deposited. You can see that multiple levels will be um, covered with this, this injection. So this doesn't provide any specificity, but it does allow for a patient, presumably this patient have uh, left-sided pain, um, neck and arm pain. And so this would allow uh, medication to be deposited in the area that would cover several different levels. This is a patient who um, has specifically a left L4 transpyramidal approach. So presumably this patient has uh, left L4 nerve root symptoms, meaning they would have either quadriceps pain or, or uh, weakness, and this specifically allows that nerve only to be targeted. So this again would serve, um, would have high diagnostic value um, and would be very useful for treating this nerve root specifically. Now if the patient had say right L5 symptoms, um, that would not be very helpful at all. So. Um, Lots of specificity, but not, um, not as diffuse. Here's another um, image of an epidural that um, is a transpyramidal approach, and this is both uh, an L5 and an S1 uh, nerve root block. That again, is, would be specific for those two nerve roots, but, um, and, and would be covering both of those at the same time. And here is a uh, image of an interlaminar epidural done at the L5-S1 level. And on this um, image, you can see that here's the S1 nerve root, L5 and proximal nerve So this covers a larger area in the left aspect of the epidural space. This provides no specificity, but again, if a patient has multi-level disease and left-sided symptoms, this could be very useful for controlling symptoms. So is there um, utility or is there um, imaging uh, available that would allow us to predict which patients would be most likely to benefit from an epidural. And there is, in fact. So if we look at uh, MRIs, we know that the level of the herniation, whether it's any level in the cervical spine or lumbar spine, wherever it is, that is not a predictor of success with an epidural. We know that um, the size of the herniation isn't necessarily a predictor. Um, so um, it, whether there's other concomitant spinal issues, uh, spinal stenosis, these, um, all of these, um, these are non-predictors of success with natural steroid injection. Um, the last two of these are really kind of one and the same, that um, it's all about location. So the subarticular or lateral recess um, herniation, that is right where the nerve is most vulnerable. So if there's a grade three compression, these are patients that typically do not do well with epidural steroid injections. And just to review, um, a grade zero would be uh, a normal nerve that has lots of epidural fat around it and there's no, uh, there's no impingement whatsoever. 
uh, grade one would be that there's uh, contact of the nerve root. Grade two, um, there's the nerve is displaced dorsally, and then grade three, where there's frank compression. So those are patients that you can predict are likely hurting a lot, and um, they typically are more likely to end up with surgery. So, um, so having talked about kind of the philosophy of approaching um, uh, a herniated disc conservatively, we have not talked about um, cost. So next would be evaluation of cost savings. So for a outpatient microdiscectomy, the for every patient that responds to conservative care and avoids surgery, there's just under fifteen thousand dollars saved. So. And of course, that number goes up pretty steeply if this is an inpatient or there's other um, comorbidities that uh, result in a hospital stay. So that will become obviously increasingly important as we have to, uh, you know, or uh, insurance and so forth dictates what, what we're allowed to do. So some of you might recognize this comment. This was before our intervention. So. This was back in his med school days, and he was working hard, not taking care of himself, and had back pain, and you know, um, it, it was, but, but we, we did get a hold of him and talked to him. Now initially, of course, um, be like many of the patients we see, um, wanted an easy fix, and um, was hoping a pill or something would, would take care of that. I think he was actually smoking at the time too, so that was another, another big issue. So these are all um, obviously comorbidities that if, if, if this patient goes to surgery, um, we all know that this outcome is not gonna be great. Even if the immediate symptoms are resolved, so at whatever level it's operating, if those are resolved, we know that this patient's at high risk of future herniations at other levels. So um, it's worth addressing these lifestyle issues. So if for no other reason to um, avoid surgery so that these lifestyle things can be dealt with, uh, that would be important. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, I think we changed our ambulance with the colors, but this was uh, B doing rounds, and, and, uh, I, and in this basket is where you kept your treats, I think, right? Because he was complaining of being hypoglycemic. <laughs> so, what's that? I for sure. So, so you know, not every patient that you see will you be able to have the dramatic success that we've had with with D. But after our intervention and his lifestyle changes, um, this is him completing the marathon. And you've heard, you can see, there's nobody behind you. He's, he's really that successful. So first or last. <laughs> He's first here, yeah. So, um, just to review why why it's important to look at um, treating a herniated disc conservatively. One, we know that um, nothing's lost. You can certainly a patient can still move over to have surgery if that's necessary. Um, and, and a large number of these people are going to resolve their symptoms potentially spontaneously or with conservative treatments that are less expensive than surgical interventions. Um, there's lower risk associated with surgery or with uh, uh, conservative care. I did one thing I did mention I should mention in terms of breast care is um, there is one type of an epidural that is a little riskier, and that would be the cervical transgranule has been associated with um, spinal cord injuries um, and actually spinal cord um, infarctions that result in quadriplegia, and that seems to be associated with um, the particulate uh, steroid that was used. Um, at this point, the standard of care is certainly to use a non-particulate steroid, and we've seen um, the, that, that risk go way, way down. Um, the final reason to, um, to delay surgery or, or uh, avoid surgery and address this conservatively is to really deal with those comorbid conditions uh, like what B was dealing with and see if we can't um, make an impact on that patient's life so that subsequent uh, um, issues are diminished. So there's a lot of steps here. So this is a beautiful picture of Machu Picchu, and of course, you know, a herniated disc with leg pain would hinder anyone's ability to enjoy that. So there's reasons to stay healthy and 
active and avoid avoid getting a hernia disc to start with. Um, for the mountaineers that like uh, climbing, here's a picture of Everest. I actually took this through uh, on my cell phone through an airplane. Had to get 22,000 feet above sea level before I got through the swan. That's awesome. All right, so I have a few questions for everybody. Hopefully I covered these all. So one, a herniated disc. Symptoms only improve if patient follows a very carefully designed rehab program. Maybe asymptomatic, always presents with back pain, or usually occurs in a completely healthy disc. Thank you. <laughs> 